This video is sponsored by Smart School Online Art Mentorships. Hello, everybody. Today, we are talking about budget ideas for framing your artwork. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Now, Lauren, you and I are unique in that both of us have had experience getting our own artwork framed, and we have also both worked in galleries. So we have seen many, many versions of how people exhibit their work on the wall. And what I think is remarkable, people do not understand how much work it is to do a good job of this. Yes, yes, it is a job that people are paid to do. They are called framers and art handlers. <laughs> And when you work at a small gallery, generally they don't have the budget to have their own art handlers or framers pre 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 preparators. I don't know how you say that on staff. So you end up having to do all of that stuff. You're a jack of all trades. Is that your uh, experience, Clara? Well, I just think that there are many levels that you can work at for exhibiting your work. For example, I've had shows where I just showed up with the work, dropped it off, and then showed up at the opening reception. <laughs> that is sweet, but it doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> I've also had shows, Lauren, where I do everything myself from beginning to end. And honestly, both experiences are really valuable. Yes, I agree. I agree with that. I think. Having those experiences where you do everything yourself gives you a better idea of how to be a good artist when interacting with galleries. It gives you an idea of what, what would make their lives easier. What would make both of your lives easier? <laughs> Tell us in the chat, who here has framed their work before? And did you have it custom framed? Did you pick up some standardized mats at the store? Did you hang it without a frame in some other way? Because, oh my goodness, there are so many options for how to do this. And so that's what we're gonna show you is a really wide range because I'm actually amazed, Lauren, that there are options beyond just your stereotypical frame with a wire and a picture hanger. Yeah. When we were first talking about the stream and putting it together, I said to myself, oh, this is going to be so easy. It's just a wire across the back. Oh, we're done. We've got nothing to talk about. But then it just expanded and expanded and expanded as we were putting slides in. And there's such a diversity I didn't realize was there until we thought about it. Well, so one of the quickest and least expensive ways to have a bona fide frame and mat that you don't make yourself is to, in advance, make artworks that are standard picture frame sizes on purpose, knowing that when you go to buy the frame, you can just pop it into one of these frames. Have you done that before, Lauren? Yes, actually, all of my work on illustration board is six by six inches and eight by 10 inches, because I know that I can get these great shadow box frames at Michael's that fit that work perfectly. Yeah, and so thinking about framing starts way sooner 
than people realize. And when I was in art school, I never thought about it. I just was like, oh, I'll shave an inch off of this painting. No problem. But then you realize that you get screwed later on because you have this awkwardly shaped painting that only a custom frame will ever fit. Yes, definitely. That is a big deal working, making paintings, making 2D art is, oh, well, what is the full object of this, the frame? is a part of the art object, is a part of the painting or the drawing or any of that. So you've got to consider that whole life cycle from starting drawing to framing. Ariel says, I worked professionally as a framer in my 20s. Well, Ariel, we might need some help from you yes. during the stream. <laughs> please, please help us. And Jill Kama says, I got custom frames made for donation paintings. Katia says, I built my own frame once with some wood and decorated it with clay. Cool. And Ray says, I've done both custom and pre-sized depending on my financial status. Well, Lauren, I have actively in the past made artwork thinking to myself, as I picked the surface I was drawing on, how much is this going to cost a frame? Have you done that? <laughs> Yes, definitely. It's one of the reasons that I tend to work on canvases instead of on paper or illustration board, because with the canvases, I can get away with not having to frame things that's kind of in right now to have the bare edges. But with paper, you're just screwed. You have to put that under something because otherwise it just doesn't look as great. So one of the things that's tricky, though, if you do want to go with pre-cut frames and mats, you got to do the measurements because especially for works on paper, it depends on the artwork. But I, for example, had these mezzotint prints and I wanted to make sure there was enough of a border around the image so you could see the signature. And so the edge of the window of the mat was not flush up against the image. And so I would have to make sure that the copper plate I bought was just a little smaller than the mat. I mean, I cannot believe how much advanced thinking this requires. Yeah, I've done that too, where I've had to take a pencil and mark out my edges. It's kind of like when you're taking something to be printed and the printer, you have your safe space and then you have your, your bleed and they have those boundaries marked off. You have to basically do the same thing when you're trying to figure out how to get your matting correctly with the image. Boom says, when I had some photography exhibitions, the framing was so expensive. So I opted for printing everything on metal or mounted on acrylic. Yes, that is absolutely a concern. I mean, you can break the bank with framing. It's astronomically expensive, unfortunately. Yeah, I actually thinking about this, I was thinking about painting the whole time, but I feel really bad for photographers. That is a hard situation to work with there. And I know as artists, we're going to complain about the cost of custom framing, but as W315 points out, I used a professional framer once. He was such an expert. I had a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with him to choose the materials, and it turned out great. It's amazing to work with a custom framer. Have you done that before, Lauren? Yes, actually, we were just talking about this too, where you said that uh, having a good framer is like having a good mechanic. And I feel like that is so true. Because I mean, most artists don't know anything about framing. So I have a great framer. He is two blocks away from me and just the sweetest guy ever. He's a firefighter during the day and does his framing at night and goes through that process with me, helps me pick out the best frame, tells me what kind of glass is gonna look the best, like how to photograph it, what's gonna look good in the gallery. And it's just been awesome. And he charges me a pretty good rate too. I feel really good paying him what I do. And it's hard to find a good framer because dime a dozen frame shops all over the place. I mean, it's not hard to find a frame shop, but finding somebody who's really knowledgeable and who understands your aesthetic. I had this wonderful framer who I loved back in Massachusetts. He framed my work for 15 years. He knew everything about what I wanted to do, but he also knew all these options that I never would have explored 
on my own. So when you work with a framer, it really is a creative collaboration. They're not just servicing your artwork here. Definitely. They are usually very visually skilled themselves. I could call a lot of them artists. I think a lot of them also start in some kind of art creative field before going into framing. I mean, me and my framer, we used to have this joke where he would like try to convince me to try a more daring frame. And sometimes he'd pick these very strange frames and I would sort of turn my nose up at it, but then he would put it on the artwork and I'd go, wow, that looks <laughs> amazing. It was so cool, but it's not easy to find people like that. That's also very hard too. It's really hard to pick a good frame that works with the artwork and doesn't overpower the artwork. A lot of people want to get those super gold fancy ornate frames, not realizing that it will just dull down the artwork a whole lot. So it's it's good to work with a framer to because they always have to deal with that relationship of artwork plus frame. So here's the question now. The opposite end of getting a custom framer or buying the pre-cut stuff is to say, you know what? I'm an artist. I'm going to have to frame a lot of stuff in my lifetime. I should just learn how to cut my own frames and I should also learn how to cut my own mats because the equipment is out there and there are many different options. For example, this slide shows if you want to go more the cheaper route, just buying the materials. There's also stuff like this where if you want to invest money in an actual professional mat cutter, you definitely can. But do you recommend people learn how to frame Lauren? I think that it is a very hard skill to get down. If you have, if you are very comfortable in a wood shop or doing these kinds of very, um, I don't know what the word is, craft oriented skill type things. So you can give it a try, but it's also so easy to screw up and it takes a lot of time and you have to be doing it all the time. The framer, they're not usually making artwork. They're making frames all the time. You are splitting your time between making your artwork and then trying to figure out frame stuff for it. That can be very hard to give both skills the necessary attention that they need for the work to look good. John Murph says, I'm tempted to use wood cutting machines, but I'm afraid I may accidentally cut your fingers. That is not something you want to mess with. If you don't have professional experience or if you don't have a professional supervising you, that is not okay to play around with. And that's the issue with a lot of these machines. They're not easy to use. I mean, I have tried to cut my own mats in the past. It's so hard. I don't think I'm that bad at cutting things, but I could not do it, Lauren. Yeah, uh, John Murph there brings up a great point because with the, the cutting your fingers, actually I have seen more and worse injuries with mat cutting with cutting your fingers than with table saw. Usually people think that, oh, saws, they're dangerous and they are very aware of what they're doing. But with mat board, you just, you could be doing it late at night. You could be stressed about getting ready for your event. This has happened to me before. This has happened to my dad before preparing for shows. You can get very, very nasty cuts if you're not careful. Arielle, who said earlier that they were a professional framer, it wasn't an easy job. I usually frame my own because it's so expensive, but it's really nice to have it done by someone else. Yeah. So this is something we've brought up before, is when you work as an artist, there oftentimes are skills like this where you have to weigh, okay, well, is it really worth my time to, number one, buy all the materials, learn how to do it well enough that it looks professional, I could send it to a gallery, or... Do I just shell out the money and hire a professional? Which one did you end up going with, Lauren? <laughs> well, I just didn't make work that needed to be framed for a while, or I chose some of the hacks that we will be talking about later for, for cheap framing. But now that I have a framer that I really like, I'm doing more work that I can get framed, and I want to stick with this one guy as long as I can. I want to do the 15-year thing like you, even if it means me driving down to Brooklyn and saying, please frame this for me. I need your help. <laughs> and also, Lauren, I feel that 
you have to be traumatized enough by some experience to realize, oh yeah, I should just pay for it. Because yeah. there was one time, I think I was in my 20s and like many artists, I was trying to save money and I thought, okay, I'll go cut my own mats. And they looked terrible. Like it, it was not lined up. The mat board was dirty. And I brought it to a frame shop and I said, oh, I already cut my own mat. I just need you guys to give me a frame. And the framer looks at me. He's like totally mortified. He's like, well, these are not very well cut and you have a lot of mar And I just was like, oh, he like eventually talked me into paying for a custom mat. But it looks terrible when yeah. the framing job is bad. Have you seen some bad presentation when you were a gallery yeah. manager? Yes, as a gallery manager all the time, I see people try to do it on their own. And one of the things that I see the most is one, yes, the dirty mats, it's really easy to just, they get, they are sponges. They soak up any kind of mark at all, and then you can't get it off. And then the other thing is overcutting on the edges. It just, you... <laughs> You can be very good at cutting things. I'm a perfectionist and I overcut all the time and you just notice it on such a clean, nice presentation. You notice any little thing at all. That mat board is supposed to be white or whatever color it is. You're not supposed to notice it. That's the point. So that's why it's so hard. Lisa says mats are huge. Storage challenge. Finding a tabletop that's big yeah. enough for you to cut the mats and all the T-squares and everything. I mean, I don't think I have a space like that in my house. And so it's a storage issue. And Ariel says cutting mats is agony, even for professionals. And Lisa also says my husband is a perfectionist and even he was sweating bullets when cutting mats. It is not easy, everybody. <laughs> You, you think it would be because it's just, it's cutting basically very thick paper. And I think that's where the rupture is. <laughs> Basil says, great framing makes art look so nice and professional. Oh my goodness, Lauren, the first time I had one of my prints professionally custom made, I looked at it and I went, whoa, is this my, it looks so good. Do that? <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> it was amazing. I had such a great experience. Yeah, I, I had the same experience with this guy uh, nearby. He made my work. I This was for my show, for my work going to Chelsea, to that one gallery. I was like, oh, this needs to be perfect. Oh, I don't know what to do. What if it's bad? And it, he made it look like anything I've ever seen in Chelsea. I said, oh, wow, for the first time when I got that piece back, it felt like dressing up for prom or something. I said, wow, I actually belong here. This looks like it belongs <laughs> in, in this gallery <laughs> It really is transformative. And so even though we're here telling you, oh, it's so costly to get something custom framed, if you can do it, it's an amazing experience. I yeah. mean, it, it, do it if you can actually afford it. This whole first part is just letting you guys know to realize when you don't know enough and need to take it to a professional. That That is the key to all of this here. <laughs> Jazz W says, I've been making my own cradle board panels in large size. How would you handle a large size cradle board? Is cradle board when it's like a panel, but it has sides on it, Lauren? I could be wrong. Ooh, I wouldn't be the person to ask about that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I can't more. remember. I've probably seen it, but I don't uh, know that term off the top of my head. Jazz, maybe in the post stream chat in the Discord, you can show us a photo and we can tell you, or maybe we'll go over one of the options in the stream. So let's talk, Lauren, about small scale framed artwork. This is a show that I was in at Leslie University. And this is the most standard way to hang it, which is basically you have a D ring and you screw it into the frame. Mm -hmm. And then you add this wire and they have little kits that you can buy that have all the pieces that you need to do this. And then you take the wire and you twist it around to make it secure. Have you done this before? 
I do this all the time because I'm a painter. So this is the go-to, especially for hanging large paintings. So, okay, here's an important thing. If you're doing this wire across the back, for small scale work, they're gonna give you a little screw, an eyelet screw that you can screw into the sides and you can measure that out and whatever. But once you're going into medium sized, large scale work that's heavy, if it's heavy to hold for more than uh, like 15 seconds, then you want to do those D-rings because they are a lot stronger. You're using a screw gun to screw it into the frame and so you don't have to worry about it accidentally falling off the wall or getting warped or something weird like that. And the artwork doesn't have to be in a frame to do this. You can add the D-ring and wire to a canvas that has stretcher bars on it. Yeah. And that's again why if you work on stretched canvas, it's nice. You just get this kit, you screw it in, and it's not a big deal. Yep. That's what I do. And so ultimately, once you've done the D-ring and the wire, then when you get into the gallery, you can get picture hangers. They come in all different sizes. Some of them are very large. You can use smaller ones. And these, you just nail them into the wall, and then the wire falls on top of the hook. The thing that's hard is sometimes it's hard to get it just where you want it on the wall. <laughs> I never use the picture hanger thing. I think it's super... <laughs> It's it's too hard for what it should be. You can just use two nails and a level and that's fine. That works perfectly fine. That's true. Do what Lauren said. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I want to give a shout out to Jill Kama for the super sticker. Thank you so much for support. Every single contribution helps us keep Art Prof acceptable, not acceptable, accessible. <laughs> I hope we're acceptable to all of you here. I hope we're and so guys. <laughs> we greatly appreciate that. Okay, so let's talk about paintings that are oh, on structures. That's a great question here. How tight should that wire be on the back? Do you want to answer this or should I answer it? Because I know. You. Okay. The, so, okay, you want to make it, in, in my case, I've always tried to make it as tight as possible because it always loosens over time. The weight of the artwork on the wall will cause the wire to get a little slack. And you don't want that wire to be super slack or it's going to get hard to measure. It might start appearing over that artwork. I tend to put my wire about a third of the way up on the piece of artwork. That way it's not really tipping over when you hang it on the wall. It stays fairly flush, but it, the wire also isn't coming up above the canvas or frame edge. All right. These are pretty easy. I mean, I have literally just hammered nails into the wall and went, and that was it. I don't know. I feel like a little bit of a Neanderthal admitting that, but... <laughs> Wait, putting in the in the nails? Well, so I just put the nail in and then you just hook it so that the stretcher bars are sitting on top of the nails. Is that what you do? What? I, I, I have done that. Okay. I I do that for smaller pieces a lot, especially those little those little Michaels canvases. That's super easy. But anything large, oh I get so scared. I don't I don't want to do that. I I usually put a wire for those things because it's more secure. But the one thing that I do do that makes me feel like a Neanderthal is when it's not level, sometimes if you're dealing with a canvas, you can take a hammer and just hammer one side down <laughs> until it's level. <laughs> okay, that I have never done. All right, yeah. that... I, I thought it was okay because the previous gallery manager taught me that. And I've met other gallery managers that also do that. I don't think it's like, I don't think people do that with anybody else's artwork or anything framed. Certainly not. No. But for my own artwork, if I'm installing it or if it's someone that I'm okay with, yes, we've done that before. W315 says, what hardware would you use on a 48 by 60 painting? We will show this later in the stream, but basically when you start getting really big, you have to consider hiring a pro because some of this stuff can be really heavy. And 
I worked with my framer. I was making these gigantic prints and they were so heavy because they were in glass and they were in frames. And he said, you have to use brackets. He said, you can't do the wire thing anymore because the weight is just too right. much. What have oh, you been told, Lauren? Yeah, once it gets past a certain amount of heaviness, definitely with glass, I'll use brackets. Brackets are not that hard to install. It's really kind of the same as a D-ring. Just make sure your measurements are right and your wire is really secure there. But, or no, you're not using wire, you're hanging it on the bracket, sorry. So just make sure your measurements are straight. But for a painting, that's usually paintings that large are not under glass. You can just do the wire and the two D-rings, or honestly, I've hung mine on the edge, kind of like you were talking about, Clara, because mine have a really good, they've got a good lip that I have built into the, the back of the frame for that reason. Yeah. I've seen some painters do this, which is intentionally paint the size of the painting so it's a little bit neater. Is that something you do often or? Yes, I do this for almost all of my paintings. It's a real pet peeve of mine. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna frame, I'm not gonna frame my paintings, but I also, and it's in style to show the bare edges of your paintings, to not have them framed in the gallery scene, whatever. But a lot of artists just paint the one surface and don't do the sides. And I'm just like, why? Why are you doing that? This is an art <laughs> object. It's not just a 2D surface with no depth. I know you're into illusion, but why don't you bring that illusion to the sides of your paintings? What are you doing? So I do it. I don't know how many other people do it, but they should do it. I don't. I never have. <laughs> you work on paper. That's true. Maria says, something I worry about because I know little about is what kind of materials I can use since I don't want to make a frame out of something that will eventually damage what I put in it. That's a great thing to worry about. And it is a concern, especially if you sell work, you don't want to sell something that's going to disintegrate. I mean, granted, that doesn't usually happen the next day, but that's definitely something you want to talk to your framer about because a framer will explain to you, okay, there are all these different kinds of glass and mm -hmm. this type of work needs this type of glass and this doesn't, I mean, I don't have that expertise either, but again, that's where talking to a professional framer makes a really big difference. Just some quick things when you're at the store and looking at framing materials, you always want to use something that is acid free because the acid will eat away at the paper. If you can find it, having some kind of UV protective glass is helpful. It's not, it's not cheap, but it's better. And what, there's some other, there's some other archive, look for an archival seal on things as well. So like that linen tape that you showed that has a little archival seal. That means that you can use it and it will last a really long time without damaging the work. Yeah, don't use masking tape. That is not archival. So yeah. <laughs> Rebecca says, what depth for painting is enough to not need a frame? I mean, my, the, my paintings, I'm usually working with three fourths of an inch, an inch up to three inches. I think you can play around with any width, really. Even the little Michaels canvases that I'm talking about. They don't have that much depth to them, but if I just paint a nice color around the sides, just really simple, that is enough to make it look framed. All right, let's talk about panels. And these can be trickier, actually, than other things like just paintings on canvas structures. How have you dealt with this, Lauren? Yes. So I've used panels when it comes to photography. I did that little stint doing these body paintings and getting these giant, these giant prints made of them. These are 36 by 36 inches all the way up to this one of my dad's is I think a hundred or so inches long, like very large. And so for these, we've used gator board. Gator board is a super foam core. It's very hard. It's it's brittle. It has a archival top surface on it. So the 
it's not going to hurt the back. And then I use command strips on the back of the gator board. And I love those command strips so much. They're great because I can just stick them on the wall and plop the gator board on there. And then it's all, all done. Don't need to do anything else. But it is kind of hard getting the artwork itself onto the gator board. So in the case of my draw or photos that are a little bit smaller 36 by 36 inches we used a archival spray glue to adhere them and squeegeed them on to the surface had to line things up perfectly it was very difficult very scary and then for this one of my dad's this is multiple pieces of gator board that are stuck together because it's hard to do something this large and then it is i think magneted onto there the actual print is so the print is separate from the gator board itself and is only put on during the show isn't gator board like plastic corrugated cardboard uh yeah it's got like a foam core in it and the top surface instead of the cardboardy type stuff is just a white or a black very smooth bristol like surface and then is a command strip an adhesive? It's something, <laughs> yes, it has an adhesive backing to it and then it's like Velcro. So there are two parts. One goes on the back of the gator board and one goes on the wall. And then you just, the, the Velcro-y parts stick together. So you have to do a little bit of measuring there, but it's not that bad. Jazz W is saying, is there non-reflective glass? It's annoying when all you see is a reflection in a piece of art. Yes, your framer should know about this or have this. It tends to be called museum glass because museums use it a lot. <laughs> but yes, it is. So out of the three types of glass that I know about, and I'm not a glass master, so ask, ask your framer who knows. You have your regular glass that you see in the frames that you buy at the, the store. And then you have the UV protective glass, which protects the colors in your artwork. And that's middle expensive. And then museum glass is non-reflective plus UV. And that's the most expensive. We talked a little bit earlier about oversized framed artwork. But basically, when it gets this complicated and heavy and delicate, Lauren, this is the last time I ever frame work on paper at this scale with glass. Driving to this museum where I dropped this off, it was my first solo show many years ago, I thought I was gonna go into cardiac arrest. I mean, yeah. it was horrific and I never wanna do this again. <laughs> and this exhibition really broke the bank. It was just so traumatic. I was so lucky that the museum had a staff, they installed the whole thing and, if I had to do this myself, I don't know what I would have done. I really think I probably would have farmed it out to some freelance <laughs> installers because I get really scared that something's going to fall or break. Like, it's stressful. Yeah, I felt the same way with this show here. I had to drive out to the seacoast in New Hampshire and pick up these works. Huge, very, very heavy. I could barely carry them myself because they were about the size of me. And I said, oh, no, I hope we don't have to hang these. Fortunately, the artist is really into this propping them on cinder blocks idea, which I thought was pretty cool for this type of heavy artwork. But yeah, we should do a whole a whole slideshow just on art handling on how to get that stuff from one place to another because if that if it shifts at all and falls in the car ride you have broken a very expensive piece and so you have to have a lot of a lot of those rugs and things covering it and have it really strapped in and it's a lot of work and we are going to have a follow up stream on how to install a show on your own. Because at some point that might be something you need to do. And I would really rather all of you get good advice rather than figure it out on your own, which is how I did it. <laughs> all right, let's talk about works on paper, which honestly are the most problematic because they're so delicate. And oftentimes people don't wanna spend money on the frame and the mat and the glass and everything. And so we're gonna show you everything that is available in terms of 
not breaking the bank, but you can see there's a range. Like I've definitely seen super casual shows. It's a string, clothespin, and there you go. <laughs> It's yeah. not really the classiest presentation, but it, it'll work. I personally really don't like this method because the clothespin on something as as delicate as paper, it's going to leave a dent or a mark in the paper, which is just not good art handling practice <laughs> or archival practice. But yes, yeah, so this this works, and I've seen it done for many group shows with tons and tons of people and tons and tons of art. Or if you're a teacher and you're mounting a show for your students and you've got a hundred students and you can't yeah. do I mean, there's so many different reasons to have a show that I think it's important to see what the range is. Like this was a yeah. show I did. It was a senior's thesis project and she had all these little prints. This took forever. But basically the prints were small enough and light enough that we just took little white map tacks and stuck them in the corners. I mean, granted that did damage the paper and that's something you have to reconcile with whether you're willing to do that. But I mean, Lauren, can you imagine any other way to install this that wouldn't have been astronomically expensive? Yes, I can, but we can get into that in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I do it this way too. I mean, honestly, for something like a print, you can always trim the edges later if this is the one time that you have to use tax. So I've seen printmakers be okay with this option sometimes. This is really common for photography. A lot of times people will have these very small silver binder clips and just put a push pin in the wall yeah. and then hang the binder clip. And this can work. You just have to make sure this might sound really uptight, but like, don't buy the black binder clips because right. you notice them more than the silver ones. <laughs> I've seen another method similar to this that involves, man, I don't totally remember off the top of my head, but mounting those tacks on little bits of tape beneath the artwork so you're not tacking the artwork you're tacking the tape and then the artwork it's it's very similar to that this is my favorite method though magnets i got this work magnets are great you put a nail you put nails into the wall and then you put the mag then you put the paper down and then you put the magnets over where the nails are and you can get the, all the magnets in all different sizes they're called rare earth magnets and they, you can get a bajillion of them, but you have to be careful because all those magnets together, I've gotten plenty of cuts, not cuts, like blood blisters from using these because they're very strong. That's the point. You want that paper flush in there. So you use very strong magnets. W315 says, is mounting paper on canvas an option for getting around mats and glass for paper pieces? It is, but works on paper are so delicate that honestly, I would not try to do that myself. If I really wanted to do it, I would have somebody professional do it. But even then, I don't think it looks that good. What's your take, Lauren? I just had this experience with Eloise who made an irregular sized piece of artwork collage on paper and wanted it mounted on something more substantial so she could show it. So she eventually put it on canvas and it was very, very difficult. It, it, you were, you're right, it's hard to make it look good, but if you give it a little bit of a border and are very careful with the glue, you can get something that's passable. It's kind of a worst case scenario kind of thing though, as far as the framing options go. Yeah, Angie's asking, what about irregular shaped works like ovals and the like? I mean, they do have oval and round frames. You can have those things cut, but again, it's harder and you do have to plan in advance. I mean, I think that's basically what we're telling all of you is this is not something you just do overnight. You have to yeah. think well in advance about how this is going to work. Have you done Velcro before, Lauren? Yeah, occasionally that's that's basically what the command strips with the gator board is, is using Velcro. The only thing that's a pain about Velcro that you do have to remember, it depends on the type of Velcro you buy, but when we hung these photographs, they were printed on boards. 
when we went to take the Velcro off the wall, all the yes. paint came off. Yes. Oh, that was so painful. And then I had to go back and spackle and repaint. Oh. I, I am also the spackle person since I did everything at the gallery with my one assistant. So yes, I very, very clearly remember that happening all the time and it's, it takes forever to spackle everything and then repaint it. So I don't know, there's not really a good solution to that though. I think technically you can use a, a hair, hair dryer and that can make the putty on the back a little less brittle and intense but it's so time consuming i mean my feeling about installing work is obviously you want as minimal damage as possible to the wall but if you run a gallery you always have to spackle and paint yes. after a show i have never done a show where i didn't have to do that and so just be conscious of that <laughs> yeah i got to a point where i just didn't care anymore it all came off <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, here's another option for doing works on paper where you only do a mat. And actually, it's surprising that custom framing is really expensive, but just having a mat cut is not that much. I'm not saying it's cheap, but if you skip the frame and you just do something like this, where let's say you take this to a framer, they cut the foam board matting for you, they cut the mat with the bevel, they attach them together with the linen tape. And then what I end up doing is I actually have them cut a piece of plexiglass that goes on top of it. And then when I install it, I use an L pin. It's not the easiest thing to install, but wow, this is such a game changer because I had a show where I had, I think like 15 of these and just doing the mat and plexiglass really <laughs> saved me financially. Yeah, I think that it's really funny that you love that method because I personally hate it. Every piece <laughs> that I have gotten at the gallery that's either a one of those invisible frames where it's just the piece under two pieces of plexi or two pieces of glass or the mat plus artwork under the two pieces of plexi or two pieces of glass it's like nine times out of 10, they weren't secure properly in there. And so there's always slippage. And then I have to fix the artwork in the middle of the show. This isn't my job, guys. I'm not there to, <laughs> to fix your artwork in its frame. And yet I need to because the show's going on. And I say, oh, I, I don't have skills as a framer. I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. It's a nightmare. Just I, I, if you know how to do this really well, go ahead, but otherwise don't. I will say if you work at a gallery, you remember who did a good job yes. framing and presenting their work. And you definitely remember the people who did not. <laughs> yep. And that influences, sadly, that usually influences who you invite back to do a show with because you're thinking about, oh, how much effort did this take the last time? How responsive was the artist to the needs putting this together? So it, it, it is important. Ariel says, if you take your works on paper to be framed, make sure you ask the framer for archival materials if you want them. Don't assume they will give you archival mats and avoid acid tape. Yeah, I mean, it's helpful to be comprehensive. I mean, I would hope they would <laughs> tell you that and be comprehensive. But like we said, there's framers out there like mechanics. We don't know about this stuff. And they're like, yeah, do this. And we can't tell. And so you have to either find a trusted framer. And usually the best way, just word of mouth. Ask somebody in your town who has had work framed, who's a good framer, or do what Arielle is saying here, which is to ask them in advance. Yeah. And John Murphy is saying, how much money can you expect to spend for framing in a show at the bare minimum? Oh my gosh, it really That's depends. <laughs> That's hard. It can escalate into, okay, it depends on how many artworks are in the show, what kind of framing you're doing, what the type of artwork is. I can say how big? that, yeah, yeah. I can say that for something that is say, what, 11 by 14 that I take to the custom framer generally if I want a nice job can cost around a hundred bucks 
I've had it be a lot less. I've had it be a lot more, but that's like the average. Is that your experience, Clara? I mean, if I have a work on paper that's 18 inches by 24, it's got a frame and it's got a mat, it's going to be at least $300 or so. I mean, I yeah. think $100, yeah. it really has to be a small piece. It, yeah. It's not going to be anything larger than like, you know, eight by 10. Yeah. Yeah. We have many more streams that are related to these topics, such as how to price your artwork and how to sell your art online. So check these out. This Google Slideshow is also available. The link is in the YouTube video description below. It's also under art resources on artprof.org. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And Lauren and I, in a few minutes, we will be in the Artprof Discord, hanging out in the post live streams channel to chat more about museum putty and all those little nerdy things that we have been discussing. Subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And a big thank you as always to our top Patreon supporters who are providing the resources we need to keep this up and running. Oh shoot, this slide is out of date. There's supposed to be three more names in the fourth column. Anyway, wow. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know who you are. <laughs> sorry about that. Just so many slideshows. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.